Hi right, YouTube, Big Apple here. I apologize for the noise, I got a washer running, so if you hear noise in the background, that's what it is. Anyway, today we're going to talk about uh, self-defense, a topic I hear all the time because for the most part, people that want to buy a gun for self-defense, that you know want to do it by legal means, whatever, good people, don't really want to have to kill somebody, but this question always comes up. Do I shoot to kill? No, you don't really shoot to kill, you shoot to stop. So, what exactly is shooting to stop? Well, you fire until the threat has been stopped. And that's that's a little bit it's a little bit broad. I'll kind of go into more specifics later, but generally you want to use your best judgment. Keep it basic, but I'll go through some specific examples here. So, but Joe, I just want to shoot to stop. Where exactly do I aim? Well, you aim center mass until the threat is over, and you've heard two in the chest, one in the head a lot. And I'll tell you a little story about someone named George Temple, and this happened in Louisiana. Uh, these cops were, were uh, let's see, working a funeral procession, so they had traffic blocked off, and they had a guy weaving in and out of traffic, got pulled over. Long story short, the guy tried to buy out the cop, and the cop eventually told him he wanted to arrest him. But this, uh, this guy didn't like it very much, and he was like a, a large boxer, I believe, like a champion boxer in Louisiana. He's really, really tall, big old guy. And he proceeds to start beating this cop, just beating his head against the pavement, beating him with whatever. Cop's able to fire one shot from his service clock into this dude's gut. So, 140 caliber round in this dude's gut, and this dude is still pounding this cop. Bystander has a SIG 220, which is a 45. Comes up, sees the scene, orders the guy to stop beating the cop or he will shoot him. This guy proceeds to shoot the guy four more times in the torso with his SIG 220, a 45, and he has to make the fatal shot in the dude's head. So as you can see, it's not really like Hollywood in reality, and I mentioned that later. This guy took a lot more than one round to stop doing what he was doing. He may or may not have been on drugs, but that really isn't that important because the threat wasn't over yet. So, whoa, okay. So what constitutes a threat being stopped? Well, they run without firing back. If they're on the ground, if they're on arm and they flee, if they submit and they stay while you phone or someone phones police, and it could vary for each situation, so use your best judgment. Uh, in that case, of course, the uh, ultimate demise of George Temple was stopping the threat. And as I mentioned later, that your first priority should be stopping them. Them dying could be a side effect, and I'll go into more detail about that later. So they run without firing back is number one I have there. So what I mean is if the person is armed and somehow, I don't know, you uh, give them a wallet, something like that, but you happen to be armed, and they run away, there is no telling whether or not that criminal would just either shoot you right on the spot there or actually turn around and shoot blindly behind his back at you. There's no way for you to know whether or not this would actually happen. So as this person's leaving, if they're you know running away and they're still armed, the threat isn't necessarily over yet. I wouldn't suggest that mean you all the time shoot them in the back if they're armed and they run away, but for the most part, the threat will be over if they're armed and they're fleeing, but that doesn't necessarily mean the threat's over. So if you happen to engage somebody that is around you and they're armed and they've already fired at you and they're trying to run away, well, that, that is a lot more serious because they've already established a very, very blatant, obvious threat right there, a very apparent threat actually firing at you. So in that case, you probably would be justified in shooting them in the back. I think the whole shoot them in the back thing's a little overplayed. Um, if they're on the ground, obviously, they're pretty much done. That would be if they're, you know, incapacitated, unfortunately dying, uh, you know, pleading with you, whatever. If they're on arm and they flee, no reason to shoot them in the back. The threat is stopped. It's gone. The threat is running away from you and unarmed, and there's no reason for you to fire iron shots in their back. And if they submit while well, you phone the police or someone else is phoning police, that's also very good. Um, that's a way for you to not have to take someone's life, but you're also preventing somebody bad from doing something bad to someone good. So, so I just fire one shot, right? Nah, you fire till the threat's over. Reality's not like Hollywood, and handguns are really bad at stopping people. So I have real-world accounts and real stopping power. Real-world accounts, well, that story I just told you about George Temple kind of proves that if someone's on drugs or if somebody is very, very determined to do whatever it is that they want to do, it'll take a lot to stop them, and handguns are pretty bad at stopping people. The biggest thing about a handgun that's so appealing to most people is the fact that it's compact compared to a long gun, so like a rifle or shotgun. A handgun is very compact. It's a small, light weapon. You can hide it on you. You can have it holstered next to you. It's not something you have to sling over your shoulder. 
but pistol cartridges are pretty anemic. The barrels are really short, so you don't get as quick a powder burn. The velocity's not as high as a rifle, et cetera, et cetera. So handguns are great for concealed carry because they're so lightweight, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're good at stopping people. Real stopping power comes out of the barrel of a shotgun or rifle. Got a lot more power behind your projectile. It usually weighs more or it's just traveling so much more faster so, so much more faster, so much faster than a pistol round that it does a lot more damage. So can I shoot to wound if I don't want to kill them? I, I'd advise against this, also a bad idea. You could have a potential lawsuit. You could literally watch a human being bleed out and it could be much worse than if you shoot them center of mass. And uh, you could also enter bystanders. I have others, so you know, you can uh, think of anything there. I have reference in my video, warning shots. So could uh, be a potential lawsuit. They could say, oh, well, you didn't intend to kill this person that broke into your house. You just wanted to hurt them. You wanted to ruin the rest of their lives. It's very easy for them to twist that on you. If you're aiming center of mass and you're flinching and you're scared and you happen to hit them somewhere that it's not lethal and they don't die, that's kind of just a side effect. That wasn't your initial intention. So you could also watch a human being bleed out. It could be a lot more painful for the person you shoot. You know, that's, that's really not something anybody ever wants to have to witness, but you also didn't ask them to attack you or break into your home. Um, injuring a bystander, if you're shooting, you know, blatantly to wound, you're shooting a lot smaller target if you're trying to hit them in their hand, their arm, their leg, their foot, whatever. It's a lot smaller target than center of mass. And I have others, so think of whatever, you know, you, you can possibly think of there. But, uh, and then reference my video, warning shots. I always suggest to not fire a warning shot because you don't know where that bullet's going to end up. There's no way of you being able to account for that. And if you, you know, supposedly fire a warning shot and you happen to graze the person or you hit them in their limb or something, it could be much worse. So reference that video too. It kind of goes in with this a little bit, and I sort of talk about this. So, uh, but I don't want to kill someone. So what do I do? I say shooting to stop should be your first priority. The perpetrator dying may be a side effect of the shooting, but if you're still not capable of taking a life, you shouldn't buy a gun. And uh, I remember my concealed carry class, that was the first thing my instructor said. He told us, if anyone here is incapable of taking a life, I want you to leave now. And he was dead serious. And of course, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean, oh, just walk out on the street and shoot somebody. It means if your life's in imminent danger and you're not willing to use lethal force to protect your life, you shouldn't be carrying. So I have here, put yourself in the criminal's shoes, okay? Put, them in the, put yourself in the mind of the criminal. They have the privilege of living this way since birth. They've had time to talk, to, to think about this, to do this, constantly doing things. You see so many repeat offenders, it's ridiculous. They're so desensitized to violence and taking from other people that to them it's just another walk in the park, whereas to you, it's a pretty big deal. You know, you really don't want to shoot somebody, you've been a peaceful person your whole life. But you really got to think that way. So uh, we must make lawful decisions on the fly, and lethal self-defense is much more difficult for the legal citizen that's involved in a shooting. It's really unfortunate that it is that way, but it really is much more difficult for us. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the Zimmerman case because there are a lot of factors there. But, I mean, it's something to think about. He's the one being heavily scrutinized, even though Martin was obviously a gangbanger, obviously was on drugs. Just, just These are facts, too. This isn't my opinion. These are facts. But you need to make sure the law's on your side. You need to use your best judgment. Don't do anything stupid. Don't act irrationally. Don't act on an impulse. But for the most part, uh, a, lot of, a lot of states that are very gun-friendly have stand-your-ground laws, have castle doctrines. They have things in place that are meant to help you as the legal citizen if you feel you have to use lethal force to protect your life. And so I pose this ultimate question. If you don't think you're capable of taking a life, whose life is more important to you? Is it your, your child's that's held at gunpoint? Is it you who, have a, who has a knife to your throat? Is it your significant other? Is it someone you really love? Is it your best friend? you got to really think about that. But you also have to think about that before you buy a gun because if you're not capable of defending that person whose life's in danger with lethal force, you probably shouldn't own a gun. So uh, maybe I'll address that in another video because that, that is kind of a deep topic. But anyway, if you have any questions about this, uh, just post them down in the comments. I'll get to them when I can. Thanks for watching.